I'm not certain that uh, a declaration is necessary, but item 5, page 111, is very specific about the FB sector. So, you know, he, he's, he's a very sad fact that he's died and, and, and at such a young age as well. And so, can I suggest that we stand for a long time as a mark of respect in the moment? Notes 
along with the other sections as detailed within the document presented before you. I do not propose to go through the accounts of this meeting, but I'm happy to take questions. The accounts have been subject to external audit over the summer months, and the Grant Thornton report concludes the findings of that review. Section 13 asks board members to note this report. Section 2.3, this is probably a more important comparator for us. So we show on the top line the performance of the fund over one period of five years, the performance of our benchmark, which is set in conjunction with the actuary. Um, then we show our performance against the uh, inflation, the consumer prices index, uh, and against average earnings. And clearly, we're looking to outperform those over the long term, and that's something that we comfortably succeeded in doing over certainly the, the short term of one, three, and five years. I mean, have actually over 10 and 20 years, we haven't got those figures in this particular report. As I say in the report, the performance of the fund relative to its benchmark is a key indicator of the successful implementation of the fund's investment strategy, which is established with a view to meeting the fund's liabilities over the long term. And clearly, performance should be seen in the context of funds liabilities as well. to the consultation um, on the 
recent amendment regulations, which are attached, which is attached to the appendix. It also provides an overview of the proposed insolvency regime for further education institutions. The amendment regulations address technical issues, new fair deal, change how members can draw ABCs, and allow exit credits to be paid out to, paid to employers. Paragraph 2.2 covers the fair deal and notes that staff who transfer to the private sector under TRUPI are protected by the 2007 pensions direction. This requires the employer to ensure staff continue to accrue future pension benefits either through an admission to the LGPS or comparable benefits by a different pension arrangement. The new fair deal provisions remove the option to provide comparable arrangements compelling employers to enter into admission agreements. The fund has identified a number of flaws in the proposals, in particular the extension of fair deal to non-local authority employers while excluding further education institutions and police authorities. Paragraph 2.8 refers to the welcome extension of freedom and choice legislation allowing members to draw ABCs from 55 while retaining active membership. Paragraph 2.9 refers to the proposal to return exit credits to employers. And currently you might want to note that we only recover debt and don't return any surpluses when an outgoing employer exits the fund. And the objective of this is to manage both the fund's exposure to outstanding debt and an employer's exit strategy. The fund has commented within our, our response that there should be an ability to supply the return of surplus provision where commercial arrangements don't accord with the regulations. The second part of the report um, from paragraph 2.12 covers the DfE's initiative to establish an insolvency process for further education institutions. Colleges, although classed as private sector bodies, must provide access to the LGPS, resulting in the risk of pension costs being met by the taxpayer. At present, it's unclear whether the, whether the Insolvency Act applies to colleges. And the aim of the consultation is to eliminate this uncertainty and to deliver options for the rehabilitation of a college where possible. And if, not, if it's not possible to um, make sure that it doesn't become insolvent, to promote an, an, an orderly winding up process with protections for learners and creditors. The table in section eight identifies the funds exposure and liabilities with regard to further education colleges. Happy to take any questions on either our response or the um, liabilities that the funds have to a fees. Do, do many um, employees have credits from the Freedom Scheme? Yes, generally there are a few employers but they generally transfer the bodies, contractor bodies that could have, that have credits and that's used to dealt with within the commercial um, commercial contracts. Thanks Chair. Um, given the, the risk of some of the uh, FE colleges and, and other organisations becoming insolvent, has there been any increased concern from other member bodies about the liability falling on them in such an instance? You're correct, that is one of our employers does exit the funds and there's no uh, under that underwriting guarantor from another either a public body mm -hmm. or another fund within, within uh, the participating in the funds. You are correct that the liabilities will be spread amongst all the rest of the funds. We are quite proactive in ensuring that we have um, engaged with employers to make sure that we have guarantees in place or bonds in place and all some historic admission agreements which we when we didn't and bonds and guarantees. We have risk premiums added to their contribution rates as well. Um, we also are undertaking covenant reviews of all our employers and um, looking at different funds and strategies and uh, least risk strategies that we may or medium risk strategies that we may place these employers in to give greater protection for other employers. That's part of our valuation and our, our covenant. Thank you. 
friends who would to assist it. Because you know, in, in my other existences, I, I do um, prepare and comment on consultations. So um, I think that was very positive. That was helpful to me as well, John, because I did take on board some of the comments and impose it into our response. It was really helpful. Thank you. So I think that is, again, an example that you know, the Administration of Society is taking this very seriously. annual report was agreed at Pensions Committee on the 4th of July 2016 and is attached as an appendix to the report. This report presents a review of Treasury management activities with the Merseyside Pension Fund for the 2015-16 financial year and reports any circumstances of non-compliance with the Treasury management strategy and the Treasury management practices. On the 19th of January 2015, Pensions Committee approved the Treasury management policy and strategy for 15-16. As at 31st of March 16, MPF had a cash balance of £40 million pounds on instant access accounts. The overarching investment priority during the year was managing counterparty risk. Section 2.7 of the report highlights that over the 12-month period, WM calculated the cash performance to be 0.9% against the benchmark performance of 0.3%. There was one incident where MPF was non-compliant with the policy during 15 detailed in section 2.9. There was one incident where MPF exceeded the agreed limit with the current bankers when it received significant funds during the unpaid leave close down. This was rectified on the first working day with no financial disadvantage to the fund. And I will just add that that's a self-imposed limit as well that we've actually put in as a fund. Section 13 asks for the 2015-16 Treasury Management Report to be noted by board members. The reason for the recommendation, as detailed in section 14, is there is a requirement for members of the pension board to be kept informed of pension fund development as part of their role in assisting the administrative authority. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, on the on paragraph 2.4, it mentions that part of the 40 million um, cash balance is held in a, an Icelandic escrow account. Um, just wondering who's the counterparty to that escrow account? Is it an Icelandic bank or it was. It was um, it was part of the Glitner. Um, oh, right. We had money invested in Glitner. So was that more of a legacy than a yes. a new thing? It was the um, Icelandic Krona um, was put in an escrow account when the basket of currencies was, was paid out. Because ah, of the currency controls in Iceland, yeah. um, at the time we were unable to convert that Iceland krona into sterling, so it's been held in an escrow account um, for some right. time. We recently just um, sold at auction that currency. Right, so we no longer hold, so we don't need to um, hedge that for currency, uh, for FX. No, it's, it's no, it's no longer in the in the escrow account, we've actually oh. sold. We've sold Am I right in saying we've no longer got anything to do with the ice cream? That's correct, yes. None at all? No. John, I think what I wanted to say, if you could just explain is that Treasury Management by the Pension Fund is rather different than Treasury Management by the Council. Can you just explain what that difference is? Although the Council may be trying to you know, generate a return positively, whereas yours is more cash flow management. Really. Is that correct? In a real investment, the main investment is done by. <laughs> um, yes, that, that's correct. Sort of, um, you know, cash has a 0% asset allocation as part of the uh, the, the fund strategy. Um, so my team literally are making sure that the money is in the right place at the right time to pay our pensions, to them, to fund the internal mandates that um, are happening. So it is, but but there is still risk with help holding cash um, and controls need to be in place and those risks managed. So that's what the treasure management strategy and policy does is it sets out the practices for the team when managing that money. Uh, there's no borrowing either, which I think is, is you know, sort of that's the other side of the treasury management side that a local authority manages. Chair, I 
can I ask as well, um, I know you said you've got to um, impose benchmark and set your own benchmark. Is there a national one as well for um, no cash performance? There was your, it says um, the benchmark is 0.3. Did you say that there was a, that's your self-imposed one? No, the self-imposed limit is just around how much cash we have with any one counterpart. Right. So right. from memory, it's either 30 million pounds or 50 million, 50 million pounds yeah. with our, our, our counterparty bank. The 0.3% is actually liable. So right. it's, it's a... Wonder into bank operations. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
observation not in the question chair when they attended the uh, briefing this morning on I found the the GAB representatives less than definitive in terms of uh, how they're going about it. It wasn't the most uh, informative session. I think they they were just trying to set up the metrics for the Robert yeah. and they were saying, you know, because it is a drive run report, when it is the actual Proper 2016 report following the 2019 report following the 2016 valuation. There'd be a lot more further engagement with funds who are seen as exceptions before they produce the report. I mean, they have indicated within the dry run there are two funds who didn't meet, meet the long term cost efficiency requirements and they would see as exceptions, but they would have um, communicated with and engaged with part of this process. Obviously, we weren't one of them because we were great on our long-term cost efficiency, but they did make that the return. But um, as a as a, a member of the fund who will be subject, to, the fund will be subject to the in 2019 valuation. I thought personally, I thought it was uh, helpful to look at what they would be assessing at the 2019 report. Um, but it did have its limitations. Not inconsistent as opposed to consistent, yes? Um, with other fund valuations within the LGPS. Well, actually, uh, uh, using the word consistency and then the definition being not inconsistent is a bit of a contradiction almost. Uh, uh, and what I would say is that you wouldn't expect there necessarily to be consistency because there are four actuarial firms who provide LGPS actuarial valuations and actuarial services. They are all acting guidelines of the Institute of Actuaries, and when they come and present to you, seen this and I've seen this as well, when they come and present to you, they, they offer four different approaches, all of which are, are perfectly reasonable. Just as, you know, if, if Donna and um, if Donna and Donna were given a set of accounts, they, they might interpret them slightly differently because they're accounts, so they'd both be right, because there are, you know, there are a scope within which you can act. So the fact that they did find Inconsistencies isn't surprising. What they didn't find was anything which was not it, 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 this other definition of um, again, what is this, this exact word they use? Um, not inconsistent. What they didn't find was a not inconsistent. I.e., they, they didn't say anyone was not inconsistent. So, sorry. What I'm saying is they, they, they didn't find they didn't find fault in this ultimately. But, but they commented that they, could, they couldn't find consistency. Well, they weren't going to find consistency. So the act, in a sense, is a bit. Yeah. It doesn't understand the LGBS. Yeah. Sorry, John, I'm not clear. I think what they're trying to say there is also that they're going to narrow the range yeah, of assumptions are. because the assumptions now are so yeah, broad. Right. They're going to narrow the range of assumptions in the future yeah, so yeah. there'll be more consistency. Yeah. And what they've also said is that they need it to be more prescriptive around what is constitutes prudence. And I think the CIFA's new funded strategy statement attempts to <laughs> rein in what prudence means is more definitive in the definition of prudence for all the actuarial firms that follow. Yeah. I mean, I, it's just that I think consistency is something that's going to Solvents and long-term cost issues <coughs> that do need to be solved because I think there is some concern, I'd be concerned about funds that have over-optimistic recovery um, investment returns, which you don't, yeah. and, you know, ridiculously long recovery period, i.e., Stretching, I think, somebody on 25 years mm -hmm. potentially. I think they are in a focus, and I think that's right that Gabby's, you know, yeah, I think in, in effect recommending against those. But the idea of consistency in, in, in the assumptions is never going to come back. Yeah. I, I think what they're looking for also, as you said, some firms taking or some funds taking over optimistic um, investment returns, which doesn't then correlate no. with their asset strategy. So some, some firms or some funds may be saying, we're going to have a discount rate of 5%. I mean, most of their assets are invested in defensive assets. Well, they're never going to get a 5% return. So I think that's what they're trying to look at. Asset strategies against what discount rates in local circumstances and like, chip, narrow the range of what they should be doing. That was my understanding. Which is positive. Yeah. It's 
still uh, consistent. No, no. Um, I mean, it's interesting on page 140, and, and, and possibly noteworthy, in terms of the governance, that the <coughs> the fund is, is intended to take um, to ensure that there is you know, a robust approach to funding. But, but could, could even yourself as well please explain um, this, this issue of, of, of the CPI plus? Um, what advantages does that have over the guilt approach? Because traditionally you're, you're actually immersed as you use a guilt approach. Um, they're moving to a CPI plus approach with your approval. Um, can you explain what the advantages of that? I'm also got the risks are. Okay. All right, I'll try and I'll use up and cut in because he's obviously uh, a lot more, got more expertise within the CPI. <coughs> right, when we've reviewed the methodology, the evaluation methodology, um, we've looked at the guilt yields and because they're historically low, it's obviously increased our liabilities. And that doesn't take into account that we have our assets mostly invested in return-seeking assets. So, well, we've looked at and thought, well, is it right that we should build up our discount rate based on guilt yields when we know the majority of our returns are in um, return-seeking, which is more linked to CPI? And as our benefits are more linked to CPI as well, we thought that moving to that CPI basis would reduce the volatility in our funding costs, in our funding position, um, and also provide, so it'll be a more simple approach, a more intuitive um, approach, because as we say, we're looking to outperform our investments above CPI and not with guilt. Um, I can't really see any risk, the only risk that I can potentially see is that if you believe that our investment returns are only going to retain what gilts are. And then if that is the case and we only retain what gilts are, we would be advocating an uh, over-optimistic discount rate. Yeah. I think the only risk to add really is that those that don't like the CPI plus basis say that gilt yields are a reflection of economic activity. So if the economy is weak, then gilt yields will be low. So that if you don't have something that measures off guilt yields, it may not pick up the fact that the economy is weak and therefore you should be reducing your investment returns because clearly if the economy is weak, your likely investment returns in the future will be lower. But I think counter to that, uh, Mercer's have quite fairly said that yes, lower guilt yields might be a reflection of weaker economic activity, but it's not on a one-for-one -one basis, and particularly at the moment when there are distortions in the market with quantitative easing, it seems sensible to, as particularly as Yvonne says, a lot of our liabilities are linked to CPI, so by having a CPI plus benchmark, it, it matches the kind of returns we're looking for and perhaps informs our investment strategy a bit more clearly going forward. And more clear a link between funding and investment then as well. So really it's more liabilities and assets on the same underlying measurement basis, where before very little of the, as the asset base, no benefits of the guilt, the asset base isn't linked to guilt returns, but um, the, the, asset, the, the liabilities are linked to CPI, and some of the benchmarks you have will be linked to CPI and the ones I do, which is a pretty popular tool. Yes, and as we move, for example, into infrastructure, those assets tend to have some sort of inflation linkage. So it does mean we're looking for assets, some property type assets, some real, certainly real assets that will give us a greater inflation linkage. So it, it will direct to a certain extent our investment strategy going forward. Anyone else have any thoughts or comments? No, that's okay. I think that 8.2 is, is, is very popular, as I said before, because you know, the fund appears, to, to my mind, is seeking to meet some of the risks uh, and mitigate the risks of the places. Especially if you are, we are going to move to like bespoke risk management strategies. The employer risk is something which does because um, I'm involved in another fund elsewhere and I just had an employer go out of the fund, a long standing employer. Um, because the change of circumstances in that employer. Mm -hmm. If one's a strong employer, then you can leave it. Okay, can we move to the Items from my colleagues, and I do the uh, straightforward ones like uh, pension. 
Extension Board events. And as you can see, 26th of October, there is an event in Liverpool, uh, which SIPRA have organised in conjunction with Barnet Boddingham. Uh, it's an afternoon session. It's exclusively for board members, an opportunity for updates, some training on specific topics, and an opportunity for discussion and networking. So a date for your diaries. Uh, I trust some or all of you are able to make it. We'll send out an invitation tomorrow. In fact, you can respond to that, or I'll obviously have to take responses now uh, if, you'd, if you'd like to attend. Me too. I went to one in London, um, which was an all-day one, and it, it was good because you also heard from other, other boards, and you were finding experience of other boards, you know, it was very different in terms of this board. And every board is different, and if you hear people start talking, it's interesting, you know, the different approaches that have been taken by different boards, it is quite a learning experience, I think, um, in that sense, if, if people do talk about what they're doing. Um, but also, hopefully, the presentations from the Sixth and Brian Wedding are also, I thought were informative. Is this going to be a one board event perhaps? Um, they are doing one um, more next year again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're, if you're um, in Carlisle, let's say, um, you come down for three hours of. They're doing about four places in the country. Mm -hmm. There's one here, one in Cheltenham, one in London. to see how many boards apart from ourselves are present. It's also in my diary. Clearly the role of the Pension Board is around assisting the administering authority, it is around holding the pension fund and the officers to account, and hopefully that, that is an opportunity for uh, employers to ask questions um, and get answers from someone that's, or some ones that are there in a more independent <coughs> That's <laughs> exactly what we'll come for their employer contribution it, rate, so they get out of evaluation year. It tends to be usual people um, who attend, but as Ivan quite rightly says, evaluation year always the best attendance. So it's well, there's still space.
So if anyone has any comments or questions at this point, can you restrict it to, to, to item 10, which does contain um, the submission that was made by the Northern Board? And um, then I'll these up and say, if anyone's got any questions about 16 and 8, make sure you keep it to, to the end. Please. Yes, thank you. The final submission needed to be made by the 15th of July. Um, pensions committee approval was given for, for that submission to be made. It was still in draft form at that stage, but we, with the approval of the chair, we made a submission. I think probably the uh, appendix one, appendix item one, which is the, the covering letter uh, on page 155, which we sent uh, to government, really sets out the highlights of our of our pooling submission. We felt that we met all four, four criteria around size of the, the pool. The government was saying £25 billion. Pounds. We were £35 billion. Pounds. We felt we had clear and strong governance arrangements uh, for the pool. And those are set out uh, in, the, in the second appendix. In terms of cost savings, uh, you'll see on, the, on page 156, the, uh, the fourth paragraph, uh, just above infrastructure, we're looking to cut costs by 25%, and we think that's you know, an ambitious uh, and, and real value to, uh, to taxpayers. And then finally, in terms of, of infrastructure, we set out really at the initiation of our submission that we're looking to have a billion plus infrastructure pot uh, in the coming weeks. We believe that it can be scaled up to enable other pools to participate in that as well. Uh, the three funds in the Northern Pool have uh, committed to investing up to 10% of our assets in infrastructure investments if there are appropriate opportunities, and clearly that's subject to a uh, committee approving that and for uh, it to be seen as appropriate advice uh, and here's some cost savings. We expect to be the lowest cost pool in the LGPS on a like for like basis. And we also feel that our government's arrangements are simple and deliver on the government's aims of accountability for the taxpayer. In the covering letter, we make the point that we're not proposing to establish an ACS at the beginning. That's an authorised contractual scheme. That's the uh, regulatory structure that most people are putting in place, which is more appropriate for liquid assets because our focus is on alternatives. Uh, an ACS does bring considerable additional costs which are set out in one of the exempt appendices 